Hi, welcome to Street Priest Ministries. I'm your host, Brother Jay, as we're taking the Gospels back to the streets. Today's drive through message is The Lion's Den, Story of Daniel. So turn in your Bibles to 2 Kings 25, 521. All right, today we're going to deal with uh, Daniel. He's a great prophet in the Bible. Now, I'm not going to dwell or delve, I should say, into his prophecies as much today as the person and him as far as what he did in faith. Um, Daniel prophecy, if you want to really get into that, um, Age of the Beast is the video where I dwell, you know, where I dwell more on his prophecies. Here we just talk about the man and his faith. Um, we're going to start in 2 Kings because you're dealing with the captivity. Babylon, God had told him 70 years would be their punishment. And Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, would capture them and take them into captivity for those 70 years for worshiping idols. Also for uh, the Sabbath, not keeping the Sabbath. God tallied out the Sabbath and he said, okay, this is the time that you're going to do. Now this occurred anywhere around 606 to 604 B.C., give or take. For us, when they first Babylon first seized uh, Jerusalem, and they were they tried to form an allegiance with Egypt, and God said He told His prophets that's not going to stand. Uh, God was really upset with that. I think Isaiah and Jeremiah touches on it in uh, the Book of Kings as well. He said, that's not going to stand, your, your allegiance that you made. Um, and it's an historical fact that they did try to do that. Um, I believe it was the uh, Pharaoh Nico, N-E-C-O, that they tried to make this allegiance with in around 605 B.C. And it, it fell apart. They routed them pretty much, and then they went on to capture Jerusalem. Now, they totally sacked the temple, took the treasure and everything in 587 B.C. Now, the reason this backdrop is important, and we're going to get to 2 Kings 25-21, the reason it's important because it gives you a backdrop, a very clear what Daniel was dealing with in captivity. And that's why we're going to read this, so you get a clear understanding of the backdrop to the, for the man and why he was positioned and where he was. God always, even in times of trouble or punishment, for whatever reason, he puts his people in key places because why? He's God. He wants to show, I would say he sets up the basis of men to rule the earth. God's in control always. Storms, whatever. Whatever catastrophe you may be facing, relax, God is in control. He's going to see you through it. And that's what we read this about. We read this whole book to show God's got a handle on all things. Okay, so 25, 5 through 21. And the army... Well, the Chaldees pursued after the king and overtook him in the plains of Jericho. And all his army was scattered from him. And they took the king. So the king had formed his allegiance with Egypt. And now they had besieged the city and he tried to escape. And so they captured him. So they took the king and brought him to the king of Babylon, to Riblah, and gave judgment upon him. And they slew the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes. Zedekiah is the king of Israel. And they put out the eyes of Zedekiah, they blinded him, and bound him with fetters of brass and carried him to Babylon. This was all prophesied. Because of their idol worship, God said, this is going to happen to you. And them 
not keeping the Sabbath and feast day. And the fifth month of the seventh year of the month, which is the 19th year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came Nebuchadnezzar, captain of the guard, a servant of the king of Babylon in Jerusalem. And he burnt the house of the Lord and the king's house and all the houses of Jerusalem. God prophesied that. He said, I'm going to destroy everything because you guys are backslidden, and corrupt, evil. You worship the false gods. I'm going to destroy everything. Serving the king of Babylon and Jerusalem, and he burnt the house of the Lord and the king's house and all the houses of Jerusalem. And every great man's house burnt he with fire. And all the army of the Chaldeans that were with the captain of the guard break down the walls of Jerusalem round about. Now you know how the walls got broke down. We taught on that, I believe. Bro. We taught on the, uh, the book of Nehemiah. The building the wall. I think that's the name of that video. And all the army of Chaldeans that were with the captain of the guard break down the walls of Jerusalem round about. Now the rest of the people that were left in the city and the fugitives that fell away to the king of Babylon with the remnant of the multitude that Nebuchadnezzar and the captain of the guard carry away. Now this is how Remember, his sons got killed, but some of the royal family members were spared. This is what this is talking about, and Daniel was part of that, him and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It's part of that group that was spared of the royal family. They became units subsequently in uh, Nebuchadnezzar's uh, court. His wife, part of his wise men, is Magi. But the captain of the guard left the poor of the land to be vine dressers and husbands. God said he would leave a remnant to till the land. And the pillars of brass that were in the house of the Lord, and the bases and all the brazen sea that was in the house of the Lord, did the Chaldeans break in pieces and carry the brass to them to Babylon, and the pots and the shovels. He took all the treasure of the temple, and the spoons and all the vessels of brass, wherewith they ministered took they away and the fire pans and the bowls and such things as were of gold in gold and of silver and silver the captains of the guards took away the two pillars one sea and the bases which Solomon had made for the house of the Lord the brass of all the vessels was without weight the height of the one pillar was 18 cubits and the and the chapter upon it was brass, and the height of the chapter, three cubits, and the wreathing work, and pomegranates upon the chapter round about. All brass and like unto these had the second pillar with, with wreathing work. This was intricate work they had made. Solomon had his craftsmen designed for the temple, all being broken, carried away as loot. And the captain of the guard took. Syria, the chief priest, and Zephaniah, the second priest, and the three keepers of the door. And out of the city he took an officer that was set over the men of war, and five men of them that were found in the city, and the principal scribe of the host, which mustered the people of the land. And three score men, sixty men of the people of the land that were found in the city. And Nebuchadnezzar and captain of the guard took these and brought them to the king of Babylon to Reba. And the king of Babylon smote them and slew them at Reba in the land of Hamath. So Judah was carried away out of their land. And as for the people that remained in the land of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had left over them, he made Gideliah the son of Achim, the son of Shebaniah, ruler. And when all the captains of the armies, they and their men, heard that the king of Babylon had made Gadila the governor, there came even Ishmael, the son of Nithanah, and Jordan, the son of Kira, and Sarah, the son of Tamar, Methophite, and Jesusite, the son of Metha, they and their men. Now, I ain't going to go no further than that. But you get the point. Now we go. And we're going to go 
going to the book of uh, Daniel. I just wanted to get that a point, point across that you see how they ended up in captivity. And so these people are broken now. Now the temple's destroyed. Judgment of God came to pass. Um, they're sad and despondent because, you know, it's one thing to hear it, but it's another thing to uh, experience. And God had prophesied it for years before it came to pass and the hammer was finally dropped. And so now they they realize that God wasn't playing. And so this, you read a lot of the what happened in Isaiah and some of the I think Ezekiel, some of the books about them in captivity. Now they're in captivity. This was the beginning of what was called the diaspora, which means a scattering where God scattered his people. And um, the punishment is meted out to them. And see, God keeps his word. When he said he's going to do something, he's going to do it. And so now they had having to praise God. That's what some of the minor prophets are about, complaining. And now they had to praise God in this, this bad, horrible condition with these despots over them as God had prophesied he was going to use them as a rod of punishment to punish him and God carries out his word and he puts up with so much he's quiet and then he strikes but he usually warns before he strikes and in this case he did the same thing now, we're going to read, this is Daniel chapter, we'll start, uh, we'll start here, chapters, we'll start at chapter 6, Daniel chapter 6, verse 1, but we'll read the whole thing, see how thing is, context is with text, and especially when you got Bible thumpers and you got Pharisees, they love to take one verse I just had this happen recently with a jackass. It took, he was taking Revelation 3, talking about, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice, because he was saying, I don't know, he was trying to take a swipe at me. You know, he's a Pharisee. You know, I wasn't sweet and loving enough. Jesus wanted everybody. And I said, No, jackass. Back up a few verses and see what the context is. And I pointed it out to him that Jesus, that same chapter 3, Revelation, Jesus had just, he made it clear he was talking to a backslidden church. Behold, I stand at the door knocking. Any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and sup with him and he with me. And I said, the context of this is to a backslidden church. It had nothing to do. It was a church, the Laodicean church. It had nothing to do with no with no sinners. He was trying to go, he was misquoting, taking out of context. And I said, furthermore, Jesus said the same verse. If you lukewarm, I'll spew you out of my mouth. Which you done heard me teach on. You follow street priests in two or three different videos. Christ don't want no lukewarm, pew Christians. And they're not fit for anything. It's like salt that loses its saltiness. You don't want a bunch of honey dripping sweet. People they said so he was using the same verse to try to convert me to sweetness. No, J, Brother Jay is a block of salt. That's what Christ said he wants. Matter of fact, in the offerings in the Old Testament, you had to the, uh, honey wasn't allowed because with the offerings because honey turns sweet under pressure. And God, you had to put salt and sprinkle salt with the offerings. God wants salty Christians, beef jerky. He don't want sweet honey dripping like you got from the Rufus Glitters, Smiley Sauls, and the New Age Balaams. He wants jerky Christians. That's what he loves. But salt's a preserve. It keeps meat from going rotten. He don't want a bunch of spoiled rotten Christian pew. He didn't occupy heaven. Uh, I'm sorry, I got some. <laughs> I digress. I got some. Let me stay focused. But anyway, I got to get that off my chest. So you out there that's watching me, do you think you're going to convert me to a 
the honey dripping, a pound of uh, freaking sugar or something, it's not going to happen. You might as well quit and give up your mission. I'm going to stay salty. A block of salt as I am to you. Call me Mr. Salt. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom and 120 princes, which should be over the whole kingdom, and over these three presidents, of whom Daniel was the first, that the princes might give accounts unto them, and the king should have no more damage. Now, typical bureaucracy, uh, he, Daniel was third in the kingdom, I believe, like a governor. He had been promoted because of the dreams he had interpreted for Nebuchadnezzar, and Nebuchadnezzar had been driven off, and, and then uh, God said he would cover him with hair like a beast, and he'd be out there eating with the cattle and roll his fingernail. And this is actual history. God's word is fact, not fiction, friend. It's a period, and the Babylonians kept pretty good records, too. You know, it's like a lot of these kingdoms. And uh, there was a time where the Nebuchadnezzar admitted I wasn't myself. He went insane. He's out there with the bees. God said he, because he got the boasting and saying, I, I, I. And God uh, rained his judgment down on him for saying, I, I, I. And I recognized the God of heaven gave him the power. He said, with my hands are built. I built Babylon. It's mine. It's all mine. All despots. You know, like I said, stated in several videos, got pictures of themselves, statues of themselves. They're the egotistical maniacs, most of them. We had a little fat boy over there in Korea doing the same thing. I mean, him and his dad, the pictures, they got to cry and bow to him once a year, pray to him and everything else. They're in their minds, they think they're God. It's never says they were no different. But God humbled him and told him who the real God is who's running this earth. And who gives who power. And he learned. But anyway, he's kind of trapped now because he had made this decree and he got bureaucrats, typical bureaucrats always trying to entrap God's men that's doing it God's way. He always trying to set traps, snares, get them caught up in this. No different here. Uh, these Maji is trying to get Daniel. Then, then um, uh, verse 3. Then this Daniel was preferred above the presidents and the princes because of an excellent spirit was in him. It's the beginning of the end for him right there. And the king thought to set him over the whole realm. When the presidents and princes sought to find occasion against Daniel, see, when you're too good, too perfect, and you're dealing in, you're within the sphere of influence of powerful and rich people that are corrupt, and they can't corrupt you, well, the next thing is to set you up and get rid of you. No different here. They wanted to impeach Daniel. <laughs> then the president, then the presidents and princes sought to find occasion against Daniel. It's a witch hunt. Concerning the kingdom. Nothing new under the sun. But they could not find none occasion nor fault. So when you can't find fault, you make up fault. You create fault. You entrap it. For as, for as much as he, he was faithful, neither was there any error of fault found in him. He dotted his eyes across his teeth. Then said these men, we shall not find any occasion against this Daniel except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. See, cunning men, they know where the boundary line is. They say, we ain't going to get him on anything because he's incorruptible. But what we can get him on is something dealing with his God. A line in the sand that he won't cross. And get him caught up between the king and God's law. See, which will he choose? Then these presidents and princes assembled themselves to the king and said thus unto the king, King Darius live forever. All the presidents of the kingdom, the governors and the princes, the counselors and the captains, have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whosoever shall ask a petition of any god or man, for thirty days, save O thee, 
O king, he shall be cast into the den of lions. So they're saying if you got a month not to pray or supplement your God, except they go through the king. And God's law clearly states, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Back then, the king was God. He was God on earth. Now, O king, establish the decree and sign and write that it be not changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which altered did not. Once the king spoke something, it was fine. With no going back and forth, the king's word was bond. He was infallible. Wherefore the king Darius signed the writing and the decree. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, and he went into his house, and his windows being opened in the chamber toward Jerusalem. <laughs> now picture this. He, Daniel knew exactly what was going on. He knew the decree. He's third in the uh, third in the kingdom, pretty much. Well, he's close to it. So he was very much aware of this decree. But show you a man of God is not going to let you stand between him and his God. He don't care what the God. Now earlier, his family, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego got thrown into a fiery furnace because they wouldn't bow to the king's statue, which violated, you know, their Judaic law. I should not have no other gods before me. So God spared them and brought them out of the fire. I taught on that, and you can get that teaching too. Now, touch not God's anointed, I believe that's the video. But here this, here this king, the Darius, go of the means. Knowing this about the, the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar. So here he go. He was set up by his wise man, his Majid, to do this. So Daniel, he's bold. He's going to open up the windows, make sure you can see him kneeling and praying. He don't even try to hide it. Being open in the chambers toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did a fourth time. Didn't stop him. Then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making it and finding it was... They were snooping. They were spying on him. Nothing new. Man, they were the NSA of their day. <laughs> Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. Then they came near and spake before the king concerning the king's decree. Hast thou not signed a decree that every man, that excuse me, that any man or well, let me start it off. Hast thou not signed a decree that every man that shall ask a petition of any god or man within thirty days, save thee, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? Then the king answered and said, The thing is true, according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which alter not. So we can't go back on this word. Then answers they and said before the king, That Daniel, <laughs> that Daniel. That Daniel with this day, that Daniel which is of the children of the captivity of Judah regardeth not thee, O king. Here they go trying to drive a wedge, saying that he's not loyal to the state. He didn't bow down to the state. He went on with his, his uh, worship as usual. He said, not the decree that thou hast signed but maketh his petition three times a day. Then the king, when he heard these words, was sore displeased with himself and set his heart on Daniel to deliver him. And he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. The king, didn't, he knew he was set up at this point in traffic, but there was nothing he could do. Then these men assembled unto the king and said unto the king, no king that the law of the Medes and the Persians is that no decree nor statute here typical bureaucrat it's the law these are like the Pharisees of their day you have to do a king they always these religious people go to the government to do their dirty work for them. 
that no decree nor statute which the king established may be changed. Then the king commanded and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. Daniel, thy God, whom thou servest, continued him, he will deliver thee. Well, at least the king had that kind of sense. He said, I'm trapped. Ain't nothing I can do, so God got to say amen. And a stone was brought and laid up on the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet, and with the signet of his lords, that the purpose might not be changed concerning Daniel. Then the king went to his palace and passed the night fasting. Neither were instruments of music brought before him, and his sleep went from him. So the king is praying to God to save Daniel. <laughs> Say, hey, I, I can't get out of this, but at least I know this is a just man and a man of God, so let me do my part. So he fasted to pray for deliverance for Daniel, knowing he couldn't go back on his word and he was trapped. Then the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste into the lion den. He had to go see. And when he came to the den, he cried with a lamentable voice unto Daniel. And the king spake and said unto Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God. Of who? Servant of the living God. That's who we serve. I don't serve a dead God or idols or anything else. I serve a living God. You should too. God is a spirit. As Jesus Christ said, they that worship him must worship his Father in spirit and truth, a living God. Not a dead God, dead religious God of religiosity, statues, and beads and whatever else, repetition. A living God that we can talk to, communicate with. That answers our prayers while we talk to him. He answered this king's prayers and Daniel's. O Daniel, servant of the living God, is thy God, whom thou servest continually, able to deliver thee from the mouth of the lion. And they starve these lions. It ain't like these lions got a full course meal. You know, they starve them for two or three days. So they, so when they throw you in there, they pounce on you and they tear you to shreds right away because they're hungry. So he stayed, God stayed the mouths of some hungry lions. Then said Daniel unto the king, O king, live forever. My God hath sent his angel and hath shut the lions' mouths. One angel. Remember what we learned about angel? Remember the video, the angel of the Lord in Canada? Where one angel took out 180,000 of Sennacherib's army, the Syrians. One angel stayed these lions' mouths. He held them at bay. One angel. God got legions of angels. <laughs> Myriads of angels. And he still got two-thirds of the host they have. So how much protection is that for you and I? My God has stayed his angel. My God has sent his angel and has shut the lions' mouths that they have no hurt. That they have no hurt me. For as much as before him innocency, innocency was found in me and also before thee O king have I done no hurt then was the king exceedingly glad for him and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den so Daniel was taken up out of the den and no manner of hurt was, was found upon him because he believed in his God he faith in his God it's a better accurate translation and the king commanded, and they brought those men. Nah, this, this is the good part here. And the king commanded and brought those men, men who brought false accusations against him. Don't you love to see the liars and the cheats get it? In God's book, they get it all the time. The ones that bought, bear false witness get it. And the king commanded, and they brought these men, which had accused Daniel, false accusers. That's one of the devil's name, accusers. The diablo. And they cast them into the den. Now let's see who saves you. They cast them into the den of the hungry lion. And they cast them into the den of the lions. Them, their children, pay attention. Them, their children, and their wives, the whole family.
And the lions had the mastery of them. They had a big time to feast, boys. Lions are happy. They got a whole families to eat. And the lions had mastery of them and break all their bones in pieces or ever they came at the bottom of the den. The lions had chewed them up before their bodies hit the ground. <laughs> then King Darius wrote unto all the people and nations and languages that dwell in the earth, Peace be multiplied on you. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God. He made a decree, bow down to Daniel's God, and steadfast forever in his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed, and his dominion shall be even unto the end. That's it. That's all we're going to read. See, Daniel had faith. Daniel is counted as one of the heroes of faith in the Hebrews 11 chapter of the New Testament. He would not bow to no false god, and he would not let the king's decree stop him from bowing to his god. He didn't sell out. So that was a good story. I hope you enjoyed it. Once again, God's man comes through triumph, and God's come through for his man triumphant. And you get to see the bad guys get it. I mean, that was my favorite part. The lion's chomping on the whole family, so... Couldn't happen to no, no nicer crew. <laughs> Y'all should not bear false witness. Ain't that one of the Ten Commandments? But anyway, if this message has blessed you and touched you and you've been listening for a while, it's time to support. It's sing your tithes, offerings, first fruit, alabaster box, streetpriestministry.org. Hit the donate button. And give accordingly if you've been taught. If you ain't been taught, I don't owe you anything. <laughs> 